Muy buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos al foro la Enciende la Tierra en su decimosegunda edición. Es un foro que me parece muy oportuno en estos momentos en que hemos conocido en este mismo mes de marzo muchos datos nuevos sobre la situación del, eh, del cambio climático, del calentamiento global, de eh, los problemas de contaminación que tenemos. Tenemos el informe de la ONU de hace pocos días. También la Agencia Española de Meteorología ha dado datos preocupantes de los que ya hablaremos. Pero en, en primer lugar quiero dar la bienvenida a las dos personalidades que tenemos con nosotros esta tarde. Werner Herzog, un eh, cineasta alemán muy conocido de, ya por, desde los años 60, representante del eh, nuevo cine alemán de aquella época. Él ha hecho multitud de películas, largometrajes, cortometrajes, documentales, ha rodado, creo que, por todo el mundo. Eh, podemos eh, recordar algunas películas como Aguirre o La Colera de Dios, eh, Fitzcarraldo, Gaspar Hauser. Ha dirigido también óperas. En fin, es un eh, personaje de una actividad intelectual incansable. Y también tenemos con nosotros a Lorenz Krauss. Es eh, científico, un físico teórico, eh, cosmólogo, eh, divulgador científico, muy conocido también, que tiene eh, más de 300 publicaciones científicas y autor de muchos libros, entre ellos Un universo de la nada o la historia más grande jamás contada hasta ahora, que les recomiendo muy vivamente. En principio, eh, la primera pregunta que les, que les quiero hacer eh, señor Herzog, señor Kraus, es ¿cuál fue su primera relación con la naturaleza en la infancia? ¿Qué recuerdo tiene? ¿Fue una relación intensa? ¿Fue una relación indiferente? Cuando usted quiera. Sí. Bueno, I grew up uh, as a refugee child. Uh, in the mountains of Bavaria, and background to that was that uh, when I was only two weeks old, uh, bombs hit Munich, and my mother found me under uh, about 50 centimeters of glass shards and bricks and debris in my cradle, but I was unhurt, and my mother was afraid, and she fled to the mountains, to the most remote a corner in the Bavarian Alps, so I grew up uh, as a child in the mountains. And of course I grew up in nature, behind the house, in a ravine, there was a spectacular secret waterfall. For us children, uh, it had mythical qualities. So it's uh, nature that always was endowed with myth, mythology. A forest had fairies in it. And until today, when I pass this forest, I fall silent. And um, this nature has, uh, has been my way to live. I grew up with very little electricity. We had no running water. We had to take a bucket and go to the well and bring water into the house. And I had no idea about cinema until I was 11, that it even existed. But what was important also, it was completely isolated, but I knew there was a world out there. And the world out there had certain dangers. Um, my mother uh, ripped my older brother and me in the middle of, of the night out of our beds and wrapped us in blankets because it was still winter, very cold. And she went up on a, on a slope behind the house and she said, children, I have taken you out of bed. You have to see this. The city of Rosenheim is burning. But the city of Rosenheim is uh, 
40 kilometers away. So in, in this, in, in, you could look out from the valley and the sky was pulsing red and orange. And I knew, yes, there was a world out there and it was, the world was burning and the world was dangerous. So uh, um, again, it was not just isolation in a rural, natural habitat that I grew up. Una, so, sorry. yeah. No, no, you go on. So, um, uh, of course, uh, until today, I feel much more like a man from the mountains. And uh, we were up, uh, uh, up on the volcano, and it's very, although it's very strange and almost science fiction, it doesn't feel strange for me. Mm -hmm. Su, su infancia fue muy diferente, su contacto con la naturaleza. Well, I can't understand what you're saying, but I'm pretty sure you're asking me if I want to <laughs> comment. I'm glad Werner talked first because I knew there'd be very no way that I could compete with that childhood. Uh, I grew up in a very unnatural environment in a city, um, hermetic environment almost. It, 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 my parents did not do anything that related to nature. Um, we had a swimming pool so that I wouldn't have to um, actually, like my friends, they had places in the, with, mm -hmm. with lakes and things, and I think my parents avoided that. My contact with nature, interestingly, was with a ravine behind the house mm -hmm. where I used to go almost exactly the same, although I never built myths. Well, my myths were more pedestrian, war stories and building forts. Uh, I in some ways, my contact with nature was through books and through thinking, reading about it. And I think that's one of, that may be influenced why I became, in some ways, a theoretical physicist uh, and, a, and, a, and a cosmologist. We, there, we were talking earlier today mm -hmm. about the fact that uh, my, uh, people often take pictures of me besides telescopes. But I never actually use the telescope. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think about what, what, yeah. what comes from it. So I have a kind of cerebral relationship with nature, and one that appreciated later. Al almost all of my involvement with nature, like almost all my involvement with everything in life, was, came after my time at home, because my parents just didn't in be involved in that. I was an adult before I went camping for the first time. and uh, and. Uh, and so it was a learning experience and a confrontation. And mm -hmm. the first time I was in a mountain experience was actually uh, in the United States, in the Rockies. Um, and I found the mountains terrifying and almost claustrophobic. It took a long time before I learned to love them, and now I do. But, uh, but like everything else, it was a learning experience. It's difficult, desde luego, competir con la infancia de Herzog, porque es muy especial, ¿no? Pero, eh, ¿usted recuerda cuando le empezó a preocupar la naturaleza? Um, yes, uh, I think it was the first time I saw pl plastic in a creek. Because in my childhood there was no plastic. Uh -huh. And um, years, years, years later I saw uh, the same creek and there was very high water because there was high spring water flood and in the bushes all of a sudden there were uh, pieces of plastic caught and uh, it was very striking for me and I thought uh, this is strange and this doesn't feel right and who, who put the plastic there? Uh, ¿Cuándo fue eso? Um, I think it, I must have been in my 20s already, mm -hmm. because plastic uh, really started uh, to take a, a big part of our regular daily life, uh, I think in the 1970s or so. Yeah, That's sure. where it really started to explode. Mm -hmm. And in his case, although he didn't know much about the nature, although he didn't have contact with the nature, En su caso, cuando, ¿recuerda el comienzo de su preocupación por, el, por la naturaleza? Sí, y creo que hay un tema aquí que no había pensado. Pero sí, y once again, it came from books. Cuando era más joven, había un libro llamado Limits to Growth, 
that first came out. And at first, the first time I realized what pollution humans were and how this, this false notion of everlasting growth was going to be perhaps the biggest uh, enemy of the planet. And it was terrifying, uh, it, uh, uh, the notion that, 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 and it made predictions which, which really haven't, it's always hard to predict the future. I try not to do that except for two billion years in the future where it's easy um, because everyone will be dead before it happens anyway. So, uh, but it, so it made predictions about shortages that wouldn't happen, that didn't happen because we developed new technologies that change things. But, um, but the clear realization that, that the way we were living was not sustainable on this planet and that for the first time, even then, and that was in the 1970s, even then it was clear that globally humanity was a, in some sense, a cancer on the planet and that we had to change the way we lived was, was uh, at some level, was clear. And then the next time was probably the first time I visited Europe. Uh, when I'm in a European city, I, I tend to see not only a city that's been around much longer, but one that's more um, sustainable. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it's, growth is everywhere and the, it's clear it seems clear to me that, it's, that, that there's inevitably going to be a conflict. And so it was this notion of one way of life versus another that surprised me. But, uh, Lawrence, uh, what, I, what I also immediately notice when, when you see growth, mm -hmm. of course there are two fundamental problems we are facing. One is there are too many people on the planet. We are too many. Mm -hmm. uh, the, our planet... Uh, easily would, let's say, feed and sustain us if we were, let's say, half, half the amount. But of course, evolution has, in, in our civilizations, has been different. But the second and equally serious is a, a consumerist attitude. Consumerism uh, of so many people is the real, real, real problem. And it would be very easy to uh, reduce our uh, consumerist attitude. We could easily save in every single household, let's say 20 to 30 percent e electricity. We can drive our cars much less and be more strategic, uh, settle things much more via the internet than uh, traveling around and flying around. And um, many little things in what, what particularly uh, disturbs me is uh, consumerism in its very fundamental form. People are eating too much. That's one thing, and they are throwing too much food away. In all the technological civilizations, it's uh, around 40% of food that is being thrown away. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is really catastrophic because uh, food production uh, creates an enormous amount of uh, engaging energies and transportation and cooling and selling it and cooking it and you just name it and, and then so much is being thrown away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have my problem with uh, all the voices who are claiming, ah, we have to, the governments have to do something. The governments are clumsy and the governments always follow behind. Yeah. Uh, they are too slow for, for coming to a real common accord. So uh, if everybody started uh, right away to reduce consumerism, uh, that would be a, a, a massive impact. Well, you, that, yes, it's hard to... The, there are two problems. You, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the fact that the only change that will happen if, if it comes from from the public and not, uh, the governments indeed follow, not, uh, not lead there. And so there has to be some sense of urgency and how one can build a sense of urgency in, in a situation which is quite comfortable. When people are quite comfortable, it, it, as many people are in the, in the first world, it's, it's difficult to, to change. And, and also I think humans become so easily and quickly adapted to new things that they, that it's be almost impossible to imagine what it was like before having these new consumer things. I, I'm that way too, but you, if I'm on an airplane and the Wi-Fi 
takes too long. I get frustrated, but I mean, it's just so ridiculous to think about what it was like 10 years ago or 20 years ago when you, there, that possibility didn't even exist and it didn't bother me. Uh, and I think we be quickly become adapted to all these new things and it becomes very hard to give them up. La, la, la gente en general también es egoísta en el sentido de que como puede vivir normalmente, aunque la previsión o aunque los datos ya es, estén diciendo que estamos en una situación insostenible, la gente tiende a pensar, los que vengan detrás ya lo arreglarán, ¿no? La próxima generación tendrá que enfrentarse. Yo, por ahora, eh, por el límite de por la previsión de vida que tengo, voy a poder mm, vivir hasta el final más o menos igual. Ese es el, el... It's very hard. It's very hard to address these existential problems that are not immediate. Uh, one of, with one of my hats for many years, I was head of something called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists Board that they set something, we set something called the Doomsday Clock every year, which would say how close we were to Doomsday. And uh, it's moved closer for a variety of reasons. Now it's as close as it's been ever in the 75-year history of that clock. But when I became chair, we had added, it used to be just nuclear weapons. It was created by the physicists who'd built the first atomic uh, bombs. Mm -hmm. But we added, we just, uh, other existential risks, and climate change became one. There are other potential risks involving uh, cyber terrorism, bio biological terrorism perhaps, but, but certainly nuclear weapons and climate change are the are, are, I think, the two greatest existential risks that humans face, and they're so very different. Uh, one is immediate and, and, clear, and clear in some sense. The other, climate change, is, always seems to be in the future, and it's very, very hard to address that. But at the same time, people are complacent about nuclear weapons. When I write something, whenever I've written about the danger of nuclear weapons, it gets less interest than almost anything I've ever written. People either would rather forget about it, or young people, as most of the people in this audience are younger mm -hmm. than I am, uh, have lived their whole lives without uh, a, a, you know, a nuclear explosion against a civilian population, although I'm sure that will happen in, in the lifetime of most of the people in this room. Uh, and, and so even there, people are complacent. Yeah. Um, Bernard decía que éramos muchos en el planeta, 7.500 millones ahora, Yeah. La previsión es que en 2050 seamos 10.000 millones. Son cifras que mmm, ya escapan a la, al entendimiento humano casi, ¿no? Y hay más cifras. En el último informe de Naciones Unidas, que se ha hecho público ahora, se dice que habría que invertir en Europa solo 180.000 millones de euros cada año para poder cumplir los objetivos de la Conferencia de, de Medio Ambiente de París, de 2015. Uh -huh. Eso parece imposible de todo punto de vista, ¿no? Uh -huh. eh, o, o, o no, no lo sé. Yo os pregunto qué, qué pensáis si la, la acción de organismos internacionales o de gobiernos puede frenar el cambio climático o creéis que ya es irreversible. I would never trust in governments to to come to real coherent uh, sustainable action. I would not trust it. It has to start with every individual. And uh, you see it among the very young, of course. They, they uh, are more aware of what's coming at us. We have been quite complacent. But... Uh, Again, uh, of course, uh, governments can decide uh, from now on for every single plastic bottle you have to pay one euro punishment. <laughs> so you would really reduce it very quickly um, in, in certain things. But uh, of course, uh, some of what is happening is counter counterintuitive. Uh, we have the initiative now emerging from the United States to um, renew um, certain delivery systems for atomic weapons, short and medium range uh, uh, rockets that have been abolished uh, in the time of Reagan and Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as I have just uh, done a film with Gorbachev yeah. and about Gorbachev, I have been very alert to this. Uh, there is a strange 
a strange attitude right now, and um, we see um, emergence of um, nuclear powers that should be that should be watched very carefully. Of course, the uh, uh, United States is playing policeman in the world to some degree, but I, in light of the dangers, I, I personally welcome Donald Trump's initiative to negotiate with North Korea. No matter if you like, if you like him or not, <laughs> uh, this is a very, very astonishing development. But at the same time, he uh, does not sign the and ratify the Paris Accord. So it's a very, uh, a very dubious, dubious attitude. And when you look at the United States, you know uh, it um, is not the government that, that will do the, the decisive things. And when you look at the European Union, I have my doubts. Um, I have my doubts. So it, it has to be a personal attitude and very simple things. Yeah, it, 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 the question is always to me, I agree with Werner that, that, that once again, one, the governments themselves will not take dramatic initiatives, I think, but we shouldn't feel hopeless. Well, some of the times we should feel hopeless. No, no, but yeah. but, but what, what I mean is that there have been examples of, in, in, in the United States and other countries of social initiatives that have produce change. And in my country, for example, the Vietnam War is a, is a, is a good example where, where ultimately the government, because of public, because there was a public outcry, ultimately, ultimately had to change policy. And, and so it can happen, but people have to be, feel alarmed. And I, I, I don't feel any sense that that, that people are aware of, of climate change, but it, again, it is, is distant. And I, on the one hand, I should say that spending 180 billion euros is not much. If you consider the amount that's spent each year to sustain research and, and development in fossil fuels, that's more, you know, people worry about, about government supporting wind power, solar power. But right now, there's over, over 80 billion dollars a year spent just on fossil fuel um, research and development. And, and that, so I think that, that that is not an insurmountable number. But I think that we have to accept the fact that it is far too, too late to expect climate change not to happen. It's a done deal. It's, at some level, it's a done deal. And what we need to do is face the reality of consequences that are going to happen at a very minimal, even if we stopped burning or using fossil fuels. First of all, carbon dioxide exists in the atmosphere for over a thousand years. So everything we put up to now is going to be um, 600 to a thousand years is there. And unless we figure out a way to potentially remove it, which some people have talked about, and, and the institute I run has, has, has done some programs thinking about it, but it's a very, uh, I think, a, a very long-range and difficult task. So we have to realize that there are going to be those effects, and, it's and those effects are going to be dramatic. And we have to think about ways to deal with them technologically, to try and mediate problems of the fact that sea level rise will happen, but also politically and socially, as I've <laughs> immigration is a big thing in, in, in Europe and also in the United States. This irrational, largely in my opinion, irrational, in the United States, is irrational fear of immigrants. But I, I say if you're in Europe or in Australia, if you worry about immigration now, just wait. Because 100 million people are probably going to be displaced due to sea level change and climate change, especially in the poorest countries of the world. In the, in the, um, in the Bangladesh, Bangladesh and, 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 and those people are going to want to go somewhere and have every right to do that. And that will cause social and political issues that we need to be... And in fact, that's why, interestingly enough, in spite of the fact that, that one of the major political parties in the United States, that I think it's the only one in a major industrial country, the Republican Party, essentially denies the existence of climate change, and certainly Donald Trump... Todavía, yeah, yeah, todavía yeah, lo niegan, yeah, yeah, a pesar yeah, de la yeah. And in spite of that, the, the, the groups that really understand reality, including the military, already realize that it's a huge security threat. So they, some of the most interesting advanced um, strategic planning is already being done. The military is, 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 is doing that because they realize it's a reality, no matter what the politicians say. 
And so I think we, we have to wake up. I, I have, I'm less optimistic about us doing something in the near term until there's catastrophe, and then we respond after the fact. But I do think we could at least wake up to the, to the likely implications and, and try and support both technologically and socially ways to try and mediate the problems that are going to happen no matter what we do. Yeah. And you see, if the world economic, the big corporations, if the world economic, the big corporations, vislumbran que pueden ganar mucho dinero con la, las nuevas tecnologías, la nueva economía sostenible, los bonos verdes en el mercado. Dicen que ya hay fondos de inversión interesados en los bonos verdes. Quiero decir que si el mundo, si la revolución, entre comillas, viene desde el propio mundo económico, ¿es posible que ahí haya un cambio interesante? Sí, las grandes corporaciones empiezan a invertir porque ven Number one, there's a, there's a popular demand and they, they uh, react towards it. So that's, that's quite evident. But uh, we have to be cautious about how do we uh, defi define sustainable. Um, a very close collaborator of mine, who is a, one of my cameramen, uh, said to me, ah, you were in Tokyo and it would be wonderful like in some cities they start to grow uh, vegetables on the roofs. Mm -hmm. And that would be so great for Tokyo. And I said to him, well, yes, there's only a, the rooftops of 30 square kilometers. How do you feed 28 million people with that? So sustainable means and all these movements like slow food movements, it's a feel good. There's a feel good side to it, but um, When, when you look at farms, uh, a, a family farm, uh, a traditional old-fashioned family farm, yes. like a hundred years in the United States, they could feed five people, a family, father, mother, and three children growing up, they could feed something like easily 15 people. Uh, they could do that. Today, you have these gigantic wheat fields in Iowa and Saskatchewan and Canada, and so on. You have automated, automated uh, uh, harvesters. And the harvesters, they, they are manned, but actually the person in the harvest, harvester is only looking at computer screens because they are uh, driven by GPS and they hold exactly straight lines if you start to make a curve It will, the next one will be wilder curve and you will have crazy curves and you will not be ef uh, efficient. So, uh, today a single person, a single person can feed 300,000 people. And because of the size of our uh, population worldwide, there's a certain necessity. And it's not a very sustainable form of agriculture. Of course, you have to uh, bring in pesticides because in monocultures they will they, they are very vulnerable uh, for infections of, of plant diseases, fungi or whatever. So uh, part of it uh, to switch over to sustainable uh, agriculture, for example, is too much feel good and is an illusion. But it's not an illusion, for example, reducing, reducing your only consumption of things. For example, I own basically one pair of shoes that you see me wearing here. Uh, it's not completely truth because I have some mountain boots when I'm in, in difficult terrain and I have some sandals and so, but I do not need more than one pair of shoes and I hope the cows will thank me for that. <laughs> so, well, I, I think but that... But it's, it's the same thing about everything that we are yeah. consuming. Well, I, I think that, that um, it's really important to point out that, that uh, there is an illusion made that addressing challenges, global challenges of the 21st century, will cost money. But in fact, it is true that research and development in new technologies is... is is an essential basis of modern technology, of, of our modern way of living. And it's, it's been that way for a long time. I think that, that unfortunately, however, while there are, there are groups devoted to that, there, 
there are large groups who realize that there can be a tremendous amount of money made in the short term uh, by just exploiting uh, fossil fuels. The, the Koch brothers in my country are, have $100 billion, and they, they own most, many of the politicians in my country, and ensure that they, and their only interest is to ensure their short-term wealth. And they assume down the road, if they have enough money, they can control things down the road. But I think that we spend too little realizing that uh, we can make an impact uh, and even governments can make an impact, at least in sponsoring research in new technologies, that will change and keep... There's, th there was a study done in, in the United States a few years ago saying that 50% of the gross national product of the United States was based on curiosity-driven fundamental research 25 years earlier. Not applied research, but just curiosity-driven research. And we need to support that now because our, way, our economic well-being a generation or two down will not depend upon necessarily applied research as much as giving, encouraging people to, to do research based on, on curiosity. Mm -hmm. And it disappoints me to think about the incredible um, inequity in money spent in one area versus another. For example, I just wrote uh, a piece which I couldn't get published, by the way, <laughs> uh, pointing out that the entire budget of the National Science Foundation in the United States, the entire budget of the National Science Foundation is less than the amount of money that Donald Trump was asking for to build a wall. Now, which is going to make us safer and healthier in the future? Well, uh, to me, I think it's obvious. Yeah. De ahí su pesimismo. Yeah. Digo que de ahí su pesimismo. Well, well, of course it's a mistake, but th that's Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, no, you just name one name. Yeah, it's true. He, uh, he, yeah. he has been elected. Yes, well, yeah, he was. He has been elected, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, you have to look at, at his base, and you have to take care of the base yeah. that voted for him, because they have been marginalized, yeah. they have been neglected, mm -hmm. they've never been mentioned in the media, they have been disenfranchised, and you better take care of the base and look after them. And every single one, you probably have some yeah. friends in Kansas yeah. or in Iowa or in Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, keep them, keep in touch with them and show them you are interested in what they are thinking, what they are doing. Do not, do not keep yeah. them pushed aside. Well, and they found their voice for the first time, the disenfranchised combined and found their voice. And the voice now is Trump. But the and prob the problem is the problem is it's all of a sudden the systematic the systematic uh, sort of nature of the United States or part of that has become absolutely and clearly visible. It, but but it's true that but it's it's not it's it, it, uh, Mark Twain once said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure rhymes a lot. And uh, we, it's often happened that the disenfranchised and, and, and people who have been set aside by the system find a voice. What's sad, it seems to me, throughout the 20th century is that the voices they find are not the people who actually uh, work in their interest. And, 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 and it'll be interesting to me to see what happens. I mean, clearly Donald Trump has found that and, and exploited that that concern, but it's also clear that he, that n essentially none of his policies address the needs. And, and it's amazing to me that you can always get people to vote against their own best interest. And I'll be interested to see if there is an impact when people see that the promises that were made, the interest that in, in them is, is not there, or whether the, or whether the media uh, the effectiveness of, of, of uh, of propaganda, essentially, is so effective that people still believe that, that, that he's working on their behalf. Just like, I, I agree with you, I applaud the, the, the initiative of Donald Trump to, to negotiate, to agree to, to talk to someone, regardless of, 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 of how awful a country it is. I think talking in, is a good thing. The only problem is that I also realize that there was no real strategy or coherence to anything he did in, 
in that talking. And, and so speak it was about a, it North was Korea. Yeah, about North Korea. The yeah. the initiative was great. It was just the problem is it was just a it was an initiative that had no basis in, in reality, ultimately, I think. And so, so and in any case, the problem yeah. is you're absolutely right. He's tapped into yeah. it, but I don't think uh, he... It, demagogues always do that. There's a long history of that, and they always tap into that, and they almost never work in the interest of the people who bring them to power. Yes, but uh, concerning North Korea, I have worked in North Korea. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I, I could see a little bit what was going on there, only marginally, but I could see a little bit of North Korea. Uh, and my feeling is uh, that even though the last uh, uh, meeting didn't bring any result and was basically a failure, it will continue. There will be some results. And I do believe the uh, dangerous situation with North Korea is diffused, partially diffused. I, I my hope, my, hope bet, so. my bet uh, in the future is that it will come in the oddest two players, Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump, may change a very dangerous situation. Same thing as Ronald Reagan and, and, and Gorbachev. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody believed in anything. And at the time, I do remember my American friends always said, oh, Ronald Reagan, it's such an embarrassment for America. A second-rate Hollywood actor now is playing, acting, being president. So, and no, he, he really achieved something extraordinary. I kind of give and Gorbachev more credit for that, though, than Reagan, but maybe... No, it's maybe. both of them. Well, you, you can, yes, Gorbachev, of course, has had, had a, a great dynamic on his side, but the odd thing is that a man like Ronald Reagan understood the situation better than his advisors. Yeah, no, I think... The advice yeah. was, that was given to him was, was to the contrary. Well, I think it's, it's, it's <laughs> people who have... A, a, th th there's an opportunity for bold initiatives of people who, who understand, especially understand public relations, but also understand um, self-interest. And I think you're absolutely right. One could imagine Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un viewing it as their, in their own self-interest uh, to do something that actually is in the interest of humanity. Yeah. And when those things merge, that's great. I suspect, given the, the way negotiations are going, and having followed them for some time because of the bulletin, that it, they'll end up merging to something that was already a, a very non-public diplomacy that was going on in several administrations, Republican and Democrat, where <coughs> there will be some agreement to... Um, to at some level limit proliferation in return for, an, uh, for some acknowledgement and, and willingness to help the economy of, of North yeah. Korea. I suspect that that's where it's going to yeah, go anyway, and, I th yeah. and, and we'll see what, whether, it's what not, happens. It's not only economy, the, the deepest of all desires, and I see, I'm speaking now of North Korea, the deepest of all desires is reunification. Yes. Mm -hmm. The South doesn't care so much about it because they are living, living in affluence and, and it will be very costly to reunify uh, uh, the Koreans. But, um, but uh, it, it, you, li you live in a country that was ultimately reunified and I think, exactly, I suspect yeah. to the benefit of... of, of my, uh, you can tell me because and you're more aware of it, but it, it worked it, in Germany. Exactly, yeah, but, but there were many factors and, and of course in Korea, there are quite a few factors, and uh, I explained to them when we introduced ourselves that I had traveled on foot around my own country, following every mm -hmm. situation in the mountains and then around all the countries, because uh, reunification was given up by politics. And it, I'm speaking of the late 70s, when mm -hmm. Willy Brandt was still chancellor, and he gave up on reunification. And I said, now only the poets can hold the country together. And so that's why I traveled on foot. And I told them, I come from a divided country that has been reunified. I traveled on foot to hold it together. Um, I grew up uh, uh, in a destroyed country after a devastating war that was self-inflicted by a barbaric regime. So, and, and all of a sudden, I had them completely on my side because they were the ones who, uh, and they declared it had one deep, 
dream in that reunification. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it'll be interesting <coughs> to see. I think um, ultimately, um, ag again, uh, I think when, when, when one sees it, the, the interest and self-interest of people overwhelms the political yeah. worries that these things happen naturally. And, right. and, and I think you're right. I don't think there's as much opposition to reunification as long as in, 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 even in the South as one might imagine, as long as there's an economic kind of... Sure, uh, yes. And, uh, well, I cannot make a judgment yeah. because I do not really know South Korea, nor do, do I know too much about North Korea. I had some glimpses. And Lawrence, in my opinion, and it's a pure observation, is everybody speaks of the danger of nuclear weapons that North Korea has. Yes, they have a few, but they have no real delivery systems. Yeah, they're, 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 so, it's, so far, it's a hollow threat. But, but, but what I observed since we were working close to the Chinese border, where there was one uh, military checkpoint after the other, and there are these young, extremely well-trained elite soldiers, and uh, they have their, their assault rifle with a bayonet. And when you see bayonets in the United States, I saw it uh, in some honor guards mm. at uh, Arlington National yeah. Cemetery. They are just decor decorative. But uh, since I saw it uh, stopping at these checkpoints and I saw the bayonets from nearby, they were filed, they were sharpened like razor blades, every single one. And they have one, more than one million infantry, and if infantry is uh, somehow, uh, somehow comes at you with enough drinking water for a few days and enough food for, for a week or so, and if they spread out over 600 kilometers and they come in wave after wave, that is, I think, much bigger danger than, uh, than nuclear weapons. It's infantry. Yeah. Well, Nobody speaks about infantry of, of North Korea. But Over I, one million, I think 1.1 1. 1 million. And, and there's a clear and reason. They're, they're so did, they're absolutely indoctrinated and, and, uh, and ready for, to die. And if they're out of bullets, they come at you with a bayonet. But you know, when people but, pretend it's yeah. not one last thing, it's not rational to have, but it's very rational for Kim Jong-un to have nuclear weapons. And I think the message that's being taught by the United States is if you're a country and you get nuclear weapons, we won't invade you. If you're a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons, we will, if we don't like you. And so what message does that send? It's incredibly rational to do what he's doing, whether he has a delivery system or not. And I would, um, if I were in his shoes, I'd do exactly the same thing. Volviendo al nuestro asunto del cambio climático, de todos los efectos que estamos ya viendo. It was the topic for this. De todos los efectos que estamos viendo, ¿cuál creen ustedes que es más inquietante o más preocupante? Eh, ¿La subida de la temperatura? Eh, ¿La contaminación del aire? ¿La subida del mar? ¿El desperdicio de la comida? ¿La contaminación del aire? No sé si, si se puede hacer una escala de eh, gravedad o... Bueno. You are speaking of scary elements, uh, projections of what is most disquieting. Uh, f for me, most disquieting what, and we are speaking about the end of the world mm -hmm. somehow, secretly, yeah. it's over us. Yeah. Um, I'm speaking about uh, scenarios that have nothing to do with ecology. They have to do with, uh, for example, an abrupt end of the internet. It will bring unspeakable, unspeakable, an unspeakable situation. And I haven't witnessed it, but, but my wife has been in New York, in lower New Manhattan, when Hurricane, what was it called? Sandy. 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 When Hurricane Sandy, Sandy. happened. And uh, there was a blackout, no electricity, uh, from the 30th or 32nd Street all the way down to uh, the south of Manhattan. And within a day, as, as you had no electricity, uh, and all the uh, towers for communication were out, you had no phone calls, you had no internet, you had no electricity, 
uh, you could climb up to 35th floor in dark staircases. Um, people were like zombies staring at their empty, non-functioning uh, cell phones. Um, about one and a half million people were in search for a toilet because uh, running water is pumped with electricity. There was no running water. So one, all of a sudden, one and a half million people in New York looking for a toilet, looking for running water, looking for buying something. You could not uh, buy anything. The doors of the stores that are opening electrically didn't open. The cash so register. Yes, and, and if, let's say, we have a massive um, stop of the internet, everything will stop. You cannot pump gasoline, you cannot make financial transaction, uh, you cannot find a toilet, you cannot uh, use communications, nothing. So within, within a week, if it's worldwide, we would have people back into prehistory where you have to live as a hunter and gatherer. New York is in a disadvantage because in Central Park, there are only maybe 2,000 squirrels that will be hunted down and eaten quickly. <laughs> but, um, there are many more rats, though. Yeah, many more rats, but, but still, still the, it, the, situation, the situation will be the Im almost immediate extinction of the, the major amount of, of the population on the planet. And only some very marginal groups might have a, a good chance of survival. Among them, yeah. let's say Inuit, who are living from uh, uh, hunting or fishing, and maybe the Amish. Amish who refuse to have electricity, who refuse to have cars, who are family farms, that they, they probably have a good survival chance. And, and it could come very easily. It doesn't even, we do not even need anyone to hack into the systems and, and paralyze all the systems which would be very difficult anyway, but if we have a very strong solar flare, it may be the immediate end of civilization. We to, it's, this Pero takes us back to the movie. We, well, eso es una hecatombe, ¿no? Yeah, well, yeah, and, but it actually is Yo me refería a la situación normal de ahora mismo. Quiero decir, los problemas que tenemos de mm, subida de temperatura, de aire contaminado, de la subida del nivel del mar, to, lo well, que ya estamos viviendo, well, ¿qué es lo más preocupante en su opinión? Well, well, although I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but let me support <laughs> Werner for a bit, um, because it does. I think it's appropriate. Some of you may have seen the movie Lo and Behold that that Werner produced, and I would happen to have been in, and we talked about we talked there about very that problem, and it is important to realize that lurking that is a problem today in the sense that. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it could. Uh, but some catastrophic event like that could easily happen, and I think Werner's scenario is very interesting because what it means is it's not the immediate impact. It isn't as if a solar flare would kill humans, but it's the it's the side impact of a world that is built on uh, 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 where we're all interdependent in so so many ways that we have no control over. Unlike a world of uh, a few hundred years ago, where everyone control there was local control but your, your life wasn't controlled from afar. And so even if it's less extreme than, than the scenario that Werner just talked about, I view, uh, once again, if coming back to what you'd like to talk about, the, the impacts of climate change, not so much the physical impacts of sea level rise, of course, would be dramatic, and, and serious storms, and um, it, it's the indirect impact that that will have on a world that can't accommodate the the those small changes a world where again a hundred million climate refugees may exist well that's horrible for their life but in a world that's connected in a, in a world where we can't ignore as much as people would like that level of 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 displacement the socio and political implications of that will be severe and in such a world where there will be wars there will be there will be displacements whether we will have to, to, to what extent it will produce the same kind of scenario that Werner talks about, where if national and international 
institutions fall, will we be reduced to a world where, where you have to learn how to live yeah. differently than you are? And I, I think it's worth thinking about that at some level. Uh, and it's not, it's not, it's certainly clear to me that, that um, it, it, no matter what happens, it's going to be difficult in ways that we probably, that are not immediately imaginable. And that's why I think it's important for discussions to happen in public, for people to realize that these, these fortune favors the prepared mind. And, and just ignoring the even the most horrific possibilities, it, we do at our own peril. Mm -hmm. But there, there are also scenarios out there where we uh, cannot really prepare ourselves, and that's, for example, uh, let's assume uh, uh, Teide, the volcano here, mm. decides or something decides to have a monumental explosion. And it could, like the Toba explosion in Indonesia, which uh, happened 72,000 years ago, uh, would um, create a, a layer of, uh, of ashes and, and particles in the atmosphere that for 10 years you had some, some sort of winter. Mm -hmm. And if you have five years of winter or 10 years of winter, which could easily happen, uh, uh, then uh, of course that would be the end of, of the human race. Well, you'd kill, you'd it would even the end of the Inuit who are, who are uh, fishing. Sure, I think... It would be I, the end of them as well, end, end of the Amish. Well, well, I think the point that you're making is, in fact, Yes, the winter is coming, um, <laughs> is probably relevant. Um, but uh, m more seriously, the, it may just, it, it could be a volcano, and there will be, there will be natural catastrophes, but it could also be human induced in a way that uh, once again seems like out of control. If there was a small scale nuclear war between India and Pakistan, which is far more likely than anything in North yeah. Korea, or even between the United States and, and Russia. India and Pakistan are two countries that, that, are, that are antagonists, each of which have several hundred nuclear weapons. It's now been shown that in that case, if there was a limited nuclear war far away from all of us, it would produce enough particulate matter in the atmosphere to probably kill at least a billion people by changing global climate in a way that would reduce agriculture. Mm -hmm. So there can be human-induced catastrophes as well as, as, well as Yes. natural catastrophes that seem remote, but will have a global impact. How, how remote uh, is an asteroid hitting us? Well, it's... It, <laughs> you, it's you should know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's remote. What's the but probability? It, it, it's, it's, it's a very small probability, but it will happen. <laughs> and and, and no, no, so the probability, is, the probability is, is, is probably set one in... Well, uh, large scale, you can work it out. Large scale asteroids that would destroy all life on Earth have tended to hit, hit that could destroy significantly most, most forms of life on Earth, tend, tend to hit the Earth uh, once every 100 or 200 million years. And, and the last one was the one that hit the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So, given that it's a stochastic process, it could happen. And in fact, it's one reason why that's something we can actually do something about. We can actually have a global. With for very little money, a global uh, uh, alert system that looks for all 10 kilometer or larger size objects that might be in an Earth trajectory with enough advance notice of a decade, maybe perhaps, or two or three years, that maybe we could do something. Maybe. It's possible. It's not necessarily science fiction to imagine we might be able to do something about it. But it's... Do, but Do what? Nuke well, them? Just, well, either nuke Divert them or just them. deflect them a little bit. All you have to do, how, if you get them early you enough... It? How do you deflect... Oh, an uh, asteroid uh, coming at us. Oh, it, very simple. Actually, one way would be to, to launch a, a, a weapon that would have a nuclear explosion on one side of the asteroid. If you have enough, if you do it early enough, you just have to deflect it a little bit. The Earth is a pretty small target from far away. It's, it's, it sounds like science fiction, but it's at least, since it's going to happen, it might be worth spending a little money thinking about how to do it, uh, because it's going to happen. You're, but you can get insured against it right now. And it amazes me that people do buy insurance policy against asteroids because, because the, the, if it hits, no one's going to pay you. <laughs> Beautiful, yes. But, but uh, Lawrence, since you are a cosmologist, 
<laughs> and we are into, into objects that are flying around. How in the long term does the end of the world look like? Very bad. Um, in, in so many possible ways, but again... But it, it might be uh, in, in a few bi billion years In two billion now. years for certain, the, in, independent of what we do with global climate change now, the sun is increasing in, in intensity, um, and in two billion years it'll be 15% more br brighter, and that will put the Earth in the zone that Venus is now in. So there will be, there will be um, unrestricted and uncontrolled climate change, because water is a... It's a greenhouse gas, and, and there'll be evaporation, and it'll be just like Venus. The temperature on the Earth will be about 600 degrees Celsius. It will not be pleasant. Um, uh, and, and, um, but, but you can imagine science fiction scenarios, because in fact, you could move the location of the Earth very easily, almost, because all you'd have to do is do the opposite of what I just told you. If you took asteroids and directed them towards the Earth, but missed us by small amounts, there'd be an exchange of energy, and the Earth would move out, a move away from the, the, you the sun a little bit. You mean some gravitational Yeah, yeah, yeah there's a three-body gravitational interaction. So if we did it intelligently over a period of two billion years, we could move the Earth to where the Mars now is, <laughs> and it'd be quite a nice place to live. Werner nos ha dicho que él no confía mucho en la acción de los gobiernos para revertir o frenar el cambio climático. Eh, que es una revolución individual, que, la, que cada persona tiene que ir cambiando sus hábitos de, de vida. Hay algunos movimientos ahora juveniles, muy juveniles, sí. casi adolescentes, ¿no? Está la, una chica sueca de 16 años que eh, ha eh, comenzado una iniciativa sí. de dejarle no ir a clase los viernes para ir a protestar ante las instituciones y ante los gobiernos y ha conseguido una respuesta bastante amplia en muchos países europeos. ¿no? ¿Hay alguna yeah. esperanza en esos movimientos de la gente que piensa que les va a afectar sobre todo a ellos este cambio climático? Good, yes, uh, that, uh, that young people are waking up. That's all wonderful and fine. And I do, very, I do know very little about this young uh, uh, school girl from, uh, this lady, this, how old is she, 16, 16, 17 or so. The only thing I have seen so far that she is demanding that governments have to take action. And if that is her whole arsenal of argument in taking action, uh, it's probably misguided. It's mm -hmm. probably that uh, others should join in with their voices we are the ones who have to change right now, instantly, uh, reduce consumerism, reduce uh, uh, wasting uh, energy, uh, reduce pollutants in the air and uh, in the water and, and so on. So um, if it's accompanied, and it will inevitably, inevitably come, an anti-consumerist attitude vis-a-vis uh, demanding from the governments to do something, then it's all right. It should be more balanced. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I know too little about her. I, I also am not as aware of her, although in the United States there recently was a similar thing where school children went on strike for one afternoon and left their schools in principle yeah. to, to, because of their concerns about climate change. I think it's a great thing, as, as Werner said, when young people open up, when young people become radicalized, it's always a good thing when they, when they realize, I was very, we were talking, when I first started to teach, I was very concerned that young people were far more conservative than people of my generation, and that was in the, in the 80s. But I think it's wonderful to see young people protest and, and become radicalized, because it's, it, then there's, a, a, then it, it, that becomes inbred, and a, with a, a, a skepticism that is a, so useful for any generation, a skepticism of government, a skepticism of what they hear in the media, uh, I think that's essential. And, uh, and so, uh, it, 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 and it will be young people, when we say we, we're, we're, we're too old. Uh, uh, there's a saying in physics that physics proceeds one funeral at a time uh, because the old people go away and then young people can accept a new reality that, 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 the, that their 
uh, elders cannot. And so I, uh, it is the only hope is that young people get, become sufficiently radicalized that they have an impact at a personal level and eventually they will have an impact at, a gov at an institutional level. And I was saying to yeah. Werner today, and you had an interesting response, so maybe you'll give it, but uh, that it would be good if young people did a class action suit against all people over 40 mm -hmm. uh, for having produced a world that, that will be m miserable for them, potentially. And Werner had a very good argument of what he, what he thought the... Yeah, the, punishment should be death. Yes, that's what he <laughs> thought. The punishment should be death. That would, be, that would certainly awaken people, I guess. But, uh, in, but in, uh, Lawrence, one thing, you speak about radicalizing. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would say, uh, wonderful, not all of them are radicalized. Yeah. So I would say active, they, yeah. they become activists. Sure, that's a better and, word. And for, for decades, for decades, I kept looking around and I kept thinking, where are the young people who are actively going into political issues? Where are they? Where are the young people who are really... Uh, in an activist mode into changing what we are seeing in cinema. That's my mm. profession. So where are they? Why do I have to play the next and the, and the next generation during my lifetime? I had to replace two generations that were, that were lame and sitting on their, uh, in their chairs and, and, and accepting a system that is awful. And when I speak about the system, I, I speak about... Uh, uh, the, the, the big, very, very big uh, uh, part of the entertainment industry. And, and this has not transformed into anything. Where are they? And, and it's good to see that, that all of a sudden uh, younger people are coming and, and are activated and they keep pushing me. And I don't have to push them. I wish there were much, many more who yeah. were pushing me or pushing you yeah, sure. in, in your field of studies. I think, I think it's, it's surprise. I don't I'm shocked, and maybe the people in the room here who are as old, I just never, th growing up in the 1960s, which is when I did, I just never imagined a world that we live in today. I just, it, seemed, it seemed so clear to me that, uh, that, that, that activism could play a role. And, and I didn't, I mean, I just couldn't imagine many things. I didn't think religion would still exist when, I, I, at the present time. I thought we'd overcome that. I thought we'd overcome um, this illusion, uh, it, that, it, this illusion in my country of American exceptionalism, that somehow we're the wonderful benefactor. I mean, that we got over that with the Vietnam War, and it's, so it's sort of, it's, it's no, heartening. Not, not completely. No. It's... It's not true. America is not over exceptionalism yet. Oh, no, it's not. No, no, so we, we got are. over it then, and now it's been... It's yeah. not only not over it, it's the, it's the heart of American politics, is that the United States is exceptional. It's exceptionally bad, in my opinion, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, and, it, I mean, of course, these are all stereotypes. I mean, yeah. there's many... There are many good things that come out of the United States, so let me not suggest that. But in terms of global impact, it's this notion that... These notions that people were so skeptical of, it's about time that an activism... So I'm heartened indeed by this, by, by at least seeing young people begin to see that. And unfortunately, what generally creates activism is, is bad situations. And so, so you, people don't generate that themselves. It's out of fear. In the United States, what created the modern science establishment, or at least the education of young people in science, was the fear of Sputnik. The, when, the first, when Russia suddenly, mm -hmm. suddenly the United States wasn't a technological leader, that caused huge em emphasis on educating people in science. I often ask, what will be the Sputnik moment for climate change? Or, uh, so that people, and that we, unfortunately as a society, we all, and as humans, we tend to respond not proactively, but retroactively. A catastrophe has to happen before we realize the necessity to deal with it. It's unfortunate, but it seems to me just the way things are. Usted está convencido entonces de que primero tenemos que tener la catástrofe y luego tendremos una alguna solución, porque Werner propone una revolución individual para frenar el cambio climático en la que usted no cree mucho, ¿no? Well, I. I... Well, I, look, I do think it would be wonderful, but how do you get people to do that? 
Um, I, it's diffi- I don't see any evidence. I, I see some level, but, but the kind of change that's going to be required, we, we're, not going to, we're not going to change our way of life at a level in the next five years, at the level that would keep the Earth to two degrees, uh, to one degree Celsius or, uh, or you know, two degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we're, we're, we're just not going to do that. It's an illusion to imagine that's going to happen. And so, yes, we all need to do exactly what Werner said. We can do much more. Um, there was a young, uh, someone I've known for a long time in the United States named Amory Lovins, who, who was a, uh, an engineer who talked about conservation, and pointed out that you can do so much more in st- instead, for example, we talk about nuclear power plants. It's true that they don't produce carbon dioxide, but it's also true that they cost an incredible amount of money and, and produce an infrastructure and require 20 years to, to be built, whereas you could save so much more energy by just using less, and it's so much cheaper mm-hmm. to do that. Yeah. So that, that's just a, that, that's a fact. And, and it's absolutely true that we as a, as a society could, do, could respond immediately in so many ways that we're not, but I, I guess I'm more pessimistic that, 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 that we'll do that. And even <laughs> if we do that, what, what, it's, it's mathematics that works against us in the sense that because carbon dioxide, the, all the carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere remains there, 10 years ago, if we wanted to get to the level of the Paris Accord, we would have had to reduce carbon emissions by 5% per year. But because in that period we've dumped about 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide per, per, per year into the atmosphere, and it's still there, now, if we wanted to achieve the same goals, we'd have to change things by 8%. In five years, we'd have to change things by 12%. And every time, year that we wait, it becomes more difficult to do that. And I, I'm sorry if I sound pessimistic, but it's just a fact. Mm-hmm. And I, I would just want to add, yes, of course, we can immediately reduce our own consumerism by 5, 10, 20, 30, even more percent. Yeah. Uh, but when I speak about individual instant action, that's only part, of course, I, I'm also an advocate of, of uh, uh, action, communal actions, governments. Of course, they can influence a lot. Uh, and, and they can pass certain very simple legislation. Uh, that doesn't cost anything at all, for example, uh, under Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger, of all governor who has become governor of California. He introduced legislation for California. You have some sort of so-called carpool lanes mm-hmm. on the freeway, it says three, four, five, six parallel lanes. But if you drive an electric car or a hybrid car and you are alone in the car, you can use this carpool lane. Otherwise, you can use it only if there are uh, if, if there are at least two or three people in the car, or more than, more than two people in the car. And it doesn't cost anyone anything, but of course uh, has had an enormous impact on, uh, uh, on the car market. People in California are much more into hybrid cars than anyone else in the United States. But, and, but at the same and time... it was government action that cost nothing exactly. in at the f- all. Yeah. In the first world. But the other thing that we should mention, which I guess I'll play the... It's unusual that I'll play the role of bad yeah. cop with the two of us. But um, uh, the, 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 we have to also realize that at the same time, while the first world can take action, the third world wants to come out of poverty and has every right to come out of poverty. And that means that every individual in India or China... We're seeing it happen in China, right? they're using more energy. And, and it's kind of, it's, it's hypocritical, of course, to say, well, you have to look at China. China is now using, producing, you know, using more energy yeah. per capita. Uh, but, you know, we, we created the problem. As, as people used to say, my parents owned a small store and it, it, it was a sign saying, if you, if you break it, it's yours. And we, we've already broken it. And, and so we're going to see this problem exacerbated because we fully expect there's, that India and China, we should hope that, that, that pe- those and Bangladesh and everywhere else should come out of poverty. We should hope for that. But that, that will produce a, 
a more, already a more difficult problem to deal with it because um, it's difficult to come out of that without using more energy and producing more waste in the process. It's difficult. I, el subtítulo de esta conferencia, de esta charla, es Ciegos, yeah. Ciegos junto al abismo. Blind. Creo que Next to the abyss, hemos, yeah. hemos <laughs> explicado, habéis explicado bastante mm -hmm. la ceguera ante el abismo, ¿no? Well, good. Now what? Bueno, va, vamos a ver ahora qué piensa el público y qué preguntas tienen sobre mm -hmm. este mundo okay. en el que vivimos. Les recuerdo que las preguntas no duren más de un minuto, por favor para que puedan eh, intervenir varias personas. Sí, sí. I think it's working. I think it's working now. Let's take well, another microphone see? if this doesn't function. Hello, hello. I can hear yeah, you. Speak, speak louder. Speak Must loud. Does it work? Yes. So you, so sí, 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 se oye. Perdona. Um, I wanted to know what impact do you guys. Can think? you speak up a little bit to, to the microphone? Uh, what impact do you guys think um, something like vegetarianism has on? these kind of issues like climate change and all that and uh, apart from what you think it does what are you guys doing about it ah very good do you want to start no, what impact start. the question was what impact does vegetarianism I'm have on climate change and <coughs> i think you'll you can start you know because i know well, I have, yes i have my doubts about uh, purely vegetarian food we are biologically we are made to be omnivores so it's our biological destiny. And I do like a steak once in a while, <laughs> but I have reduced uh, the amount of steaks that I would eat per month. So uh, being aware not only of ecological issues, but being aware of my wife who wants me to eat a little bit more healthy. I think, you know, the point you made is a very important one. It's well, it's, it's very clear that, that the develop meat, that, that the amount of carbon dioxide produced to, for, for a cow, to make a cow and feed a cow instead of feeding people is, is immense. And it, it would really, it, there's no doubt that, that, that reducing the consumption of meat can be a significant, can, can play a non-trivial role yeah. in addressing carbon reduction. It is. It, and once again, it, it, but there is this difficulty, and, and, and in the sense that, at least culturally, it's, it, it's a, it requires a cultural shift, which is much harder to, to, to generate without, in the long term, of course, cultures can change. So, yes, uh, and I, so it, it's a good example. I recognize that being a vegetarian would be a ethically and logically much better thing for me to be. And there are a few days a week when I do that. But I, um, uh, to some extent, I'm just too lazy. Uh, I, I remember sitting next to, I had a long conversation with uh, a colleague and, and friend, Peter Singer, who's, who's written a lot about this. And for that whole week after talking to him, I, I didn't wear any leather, and I, and, I, and I was a vegetarian. It lasted one week. Um, so I, uh, I'm a perfect example of the fact that, that it's hard to change. But at, like Werner, at least I have the recognition and I certainly uh, make an effort now to change it to the extent that I comfortably can do that. But, but, uh, but meat production and production of and, and unfortunately production of human beings are the two are two huge problems. And we don't talk about the fact that 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 at least in the United States we don't. Uh, and that's not the problem. But yeah. the the number of humans is a far bigger problem than the amount we eat. I think. And we were Lawrence, I would like to add. I personally. I've seen it with my own eyes that uh, 
through genetics we can create meat without creating mm. a cow. So we can we can create, and I've seen, yeah, I've seen fibers of meat that were created in the laboratory. So we can bypass the cow. Just well, you, you know, your point is really even a more broad one. We, and I, so, although I, I sound like a, a harbinger of doom, I really do think tech, there's a role for technology. And in fact, because climate change is going to happen, we need to look at technologies that can mediate that and not pretend that we're going to remove it. And artificial meat yeah. is just one example. I, I, there are many technologies that we need to invest in that can mediate the impact of climate change. It, I, it won't, uh, unfortunately, some people say we shouldn't talk about it because then we won't, it, we won't, we'll seem to stifle the effort to, to change the way we live. But there is a huge role for technology. We live in a society where technology can address things and it's one of the reasons why the Limits to Growth book that I read in the 1970s, those predictions haven't come true, partly because of our ability to develop technologies. So we shouldn't forget that technology is, is actually our friend and should be supported uh, at, a, at a very big level, yeah. I think. I would like to add, just want to add one thing. I personally have seen agriculture on a very small scale, agriculture uh, that was completely computerized in robotics. Robots would create uh, corn uh, indoors without pesticides. <clears throat> so maybe the future of agri agriculture apart of food production, of vegetarian food production, might be done by robotics. And uh, that adds to your idea, yes, we should, we should involve uh, <coughs> science and, uh, uh, and, and energy sets that are very much at the horizon, but could be expanded very quickly. And maybe the logical <coughs> theme, since I know you like to look at these weird scenarios, is that we just that once we develop artificial intelligence, robots will even be better if, if we just get rid of the human part because robots will be able to, to work very well in more sustainable environments without eating, without sex, without all, all of the things. So maybe that's the future. Por ahí hay otra pregunta. En primer lugar, quería agradecer al señor Jefesor por hacer tantas películas y documentales que nos dan tanto que pensar, porque ahora mismo sigue de pensar en muy poco, ¿no? Eso primero. Y segundo, recuerdo su segunda película que hizo aquí en Lanzarote, la de los sí. enanos, que hay una escena donde se ve un enano que señala una rama que supuestamente lo, la reta, ¿no? Y saber quién se cansa primero, no sé si la recuerda. Y entonces pude ver, creo, una visión de naturaleza que tiene más que ver con su infancia, que es la naturaleza real, contrapuesta a una visión idealizada de la naturaleza que se da más en los espacios urbanos que poco tiene que ver con esa. Y veo que eso quizás sea un referente de su cine. Y me interesa además bastante esa visión real, contrapuesta a la visión idealizada de la naturaleza, porque creo que es uno de los problemas fundamentales de lo que está ocurriendo, la idealización del concepto de naturaleza. ¿Qué opinas sobre eso? Um, yes, of course, I, I made a film in Lanzarote back in, I think, in 1967. También los enanos empezaron desde pequeños, even dwarfs started small. Uh, first of all, I went to Tenerife. I, I was up at the volcano because I was looking for a landscape that was somehow not of our planet, something almost like a science fiction landscape. I ended up in Lanzarote for various reasons because the stylization of landscape is more obvious uh, all around you. <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, I have always uh, been very much intrigued, not only by stylization of, of landscape, but let's say, for example, filming in Amazonia, in the jungle. Because I always had the feeling that uh, nature and the environment had, uh, had specific qualities, as if there were landscapes of our soul. So it's not just like in commercials that you see on television that uh, uh, use, let's say, a jungle backdrop for a perfume. But it's always abused, used and abused as a as a scenic backdrops. 
in my films, uh, landscapes have always had a much more active role. The role of a participant, the role of one of the leading characters, the role of looking deep into our soul. And uh, Lanzarote, uh, at the time I was filming there, had just barely any tourism at all. And um, it, it was immediately evident for me, this is a place I, uh, I invest great hope in. And I, I want to see a, a landscape that people normally have not seen yet. And I've always explored, I've always explored different scenarios in different landscapes because landscapes have been so important for me. Yeah. Bueno, eh, este contador que está ahí, Estaba mareado. Ah. Eh, este contador creo que debe, hay que ponerlo a dos, porque voy a hablar por toda África. África que siempre está olvidada. Voy a contar una anécdota. El año pasado eh, viajé a mi pueblo, yo soy de un pueblo de Camerún, y estaba enseñando las fotos a mis sobrinos, tengo 42 sobrinos. Les estaba enseñando las fotos en mi ordenador de mi viaje y me di cuenta de que los, lo que les llamaba la atención no eran las fotos, era el ordenador. Nunca habían visto un ordenador. Caminan dos horas para llegar a la escuela, una hora para ir a buscar agua que no es potable, por tanto contaminan cero, cero. Entonces, eh, no sé, sería muy injusto pedir a mis sobrinos, a mi madre, el mismo esfuerzo que, que tendría que hacer un ciudadano de Nueva York o, o de Madrid, ¿verdad? Exactly. Uh, that, that was the point I was making. I think it's, it's totally unfair for us to expect the uh, people in developing countries. It's, yeah, maybe, you, thank you. And then, yeah. But uh, it's totally... It's totally uh, hypocritical for us to expect them not to want the same level of opportunity and, and, and uh, level of quality of life that we've been able to build. Unfortunately, we've built it by in largely ravaging the planet to do it. And, it's, and it is not clearly necessarily possible to support 10 billion people at the level of consumption that we now have. And this is a huge problem. So how, it's not an easy answer. We need to be able yeah. to encourage, to rise, at, to rise people up at the same level as we suppress the, the first world. And, yeah. it's, and I, I'm, I'm not hopeful, but that's what the need is. And, and you're absolutely right. They, they should have access to the same things as everyone else. Uh, uh, but it'll be problematic. Yeah. By the way, I, I always like when I hear that uh, children or grown-ups are still traveling on foot yeah. because I'm very much in, uh, a favorite of that and not only it, it doesn't have any uh, ecological uh, consequences if I travel on foot but it's, it's more by experiencing the world in a very direct, in a very fundamental way. The world reveals itself to those who travel on foot So your, your nephews and nieces uh, should have access, easy access, to clean water. But if they have to, to walk to school, fine. I walked to school on foot and when it was too much snow we had to be on skis. And, and it has done good to me. I, and growing up in Canada, I, I uh, certainly yeah. walked to school in the snow. But, I, but I, obviously, and, and it's not only the question of, of being at a certain disadvantage uh, in, in terms of uh, economy and uh, trade and all these things. Disadvantage has much deeper roots as well, and that's one of the roots is colonialism that has kept 
has kept uh, the, the, the level of uh, experience of uh, uh, some progress uh, at, at a very low level and all of a sudden uh, uh, we have a situation where we really have to find ways how to, how to help improvement in Cameroon, for example, or in, God knows, Bangladesh yeah. or, or other countries. Well, and, it's a and very difficult problem. It's a difficult problem. problem. Yeah. But, but let me say that, there, again, to try and put the good side is, I think that we can, with technology, try and imagine, we've been able to, we took the low-hanging fruit, so we can develop computer systems and networks that use much less energy, that are much more affordable, that are much more accessible. And I know people who are building devices that can be used in Africa, that yeah. it, it, whether it's solar yeah. power or not. So that's the and good cell, side. Cell phones, cell phones where you can make a financial transaction with your cell phone. Exactly. I do remember when I filmed in Ghana. Ghana at that time had a huge amount of inflation. You had to line up at the bank for half a day and then they would cheat you. Even at the bank, they would cheat you. And you had, uh, you had kilos and kilos of banknotes. And financial transactions were almost impossible at that time when I was working there. And uh, now, today, in rural uh, areas in Africa, for example, fin smaller amount financial trans transactions are beyond banks, are beyond all these sorts of uh, printing money and, mm. uh, and you, can, you can really improve the situation of the, of the population. So, exactly. And so things like that can improve it. But I want to also point out the, other, the thing that you mentioned. The water is, a, as That's someone's funny. pointed out, when you don't have water, it's much more valuable than diamonds to have water. And the, war, the conflicts of the 21st and 22nd century will be over water and not oil, I think. And so that is a severe, severe issue that we, that, that is, that we need to address in a way um, that's much more difficult than maybe developing cell phones for, for, for transactions. Water is a, and water unfortunately is an area that's, that where climate change is going to, is working in the wrong direction. Fresh water is already difficult for many people around the world. The, the, the search for fresh water, as you know, I'm sure, occupies almost all the waking moments of life for over two billion people on this planet right now just to get fresh water enough to live. And that's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And, and, and we have to recognize that as a problem. Alguna otra pregunta? Sí, eh, me parece que tenemos la, la prueba del pesimismo con el que hay que mirar la posibilidad de bajar la temperatura del del mundo eh, en esta misma sala es decir, hay una minoría incompetente que es incapaz de bajar el aire acondicionado bueno, well, yes, but let me just you, you allow me at least to say that um, a line that I was hoping to use sometime here, which is a friend of both of ours a very dismal a, very, a wonderful writer of dismal futures is an writer, American writer named Cormac McCarthy, who happened to be a friend of mine and, and now Werner's. Uh, and what I like about what he says, it's very important, I think, is, is uh, he's a very cheerful person. And I asked him when I first met him how he could be so cheerful. And he said, I'm a pessimist, but that's no reason to be gloomy. <laughs> and I think that's the way we have to act. And I, I would like to add one thing about pessimism. Uh, I've always admired uh, the reformer Martin Luther. Martin Luther. He was asked, uh, what would you do if the world came to an end tomorrow? And Martin Luther said, I would, today I would plant an apple tree. And I find that a very uh, a very uh, positive and optimistic attitude. You, you know, someone just told me the other day that one of the most heartening things, it's a story, is when a, an old person plants a tree to provide shade that they will never see. Yeah. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful... 
Um, so uh, it's clear that at the center of the problem, it's the way we create and the way we manage energy, right? Um, so I just want to give uh, two extreme points to know what is your opinion on that. Uh, which one is uh, more likely to be developed or the one that you will bet for? So in one extreme is this myth of free energy. We have a source of infinite energy just in a, a, a glass of water. So if you think or know if this technology really happens, if it, I mean, if it really exists, or we are, why are we not developing that? From the point of view that also uh, currency nowadays is created on a computer. So it would be quite easy to do that effort and the other approach, which is more ex it's on the other extreme, is um, indigenous cultures have shown that they know how to actually perform uh, really sustainable for thousands of years. So why are not looking at them right now, acknowledge what they know and maybe we learn from them? So th between these two extremes, I want to know what do you think? I think we need to learn from nature, uh, of course, and, and if there's a lot of work, by the way, going into understanding how plants, which are pretty sustainable, produce energy. But the, the problem with fusion, for example, indeed, fusion, I if it were controllable, would provide enough energy for all of us. But, but it, it, first of all, the problem with fusion, besides the fact that we can't do it, um, and it is the same, partly the same problem with nuclear energy. I don't, I don't have any problem with nuclear energy from the point of view of safety, by the way. Uh, many more people are killed every year by coal plants than have ever been killed by nuclear power plants. But it's a question of economics. It requires an incredible investment over many, many years in a centralized energy system, and it turns out to be not economically viable. You multiply that by a factor of 1,000 for a f fusion plant. What, what we need are energy sources that are local, that don't require this incredible infrastructure. And when you, think of, when you say f there's enough energy in a, in a glass of water, that's true. But look at it this way. The sun is a pretty good fusion power plant. And right now, every day on Earth, the sun puts on Earth 100,000 times more energy than humanity uses. So why should, it seems to me, if you think about it, why spend a lot of money and time and infrastructure trying to recreate what the sun does pretty well already? Maybe we should use that 100,000 times. That's a lot more efficient and, and seems to me logically a lot easier than building these local fusion plants. So I think it's obvious that, for me, the solution is the sun in the long term. Yeah, I would like to add, because you spoke about learning from uh, indigenous uh, traditions and their way to deal with nature. That has to be more precise because you are probably talking more of some sort of uh, earlier forms of uh, nomadism. Nomadic people, that was how we for tens of thousands of years, the human race was nomadic. And there were hunters and gatherers and that's all fine. Uh, that never destroyed anything, never destroyed or jeopardized this, the health of our planet. The problem is that we have given up uh, nomadic life, this indigenous nomadic life, and we have become sedentary, and with that city life, science, and everything that is working at our own destruction. But we cannot revert. There's no, it would be an illusion to believe that the human race, 7.5 billion people can re go back to indigenous ways and half of us becoming nomads again. It's not going to work. So when, when, when you speak about indigenous ways of treating the, the planet, you have to be very, very clear in defining what kind of indigenous cultures you are talking. And I do believe, I do believe it doesn't, it's, it's a noble thought. Yes, uh, there were nobler, better times in, in the past through indigenous populations, but uh, we cannot revert to it. There's well, no but, way. Yeah, and, but maybe I know we disagree on this a little bit. It, there were nobler times, but it was also pretty miserable. Sure, uh, yes. And life was hard. <laughs> and and, and, the, and, and it's very hard. I mean, the, the expenditure of energy was far less because the 
if you want to call it the quality of life or the, the, the ease of living was much harder. And so yeah. to go back, you, you have had, to go back you to had, that. Of course, your, your average life expectation would be between 25 and 35 years. Yeah. And, and it has been established by archaeological and paleontological finds. Uh, I worked with uh, these people when I filmed in a prehistoric cave 35,000 years ago, and it was preserved like a time capsule. And they all have evidence that human life uh, did not last much more than 25, maximum 35 years. Beyond that, literally no findings. In other words, uh, a, a young woman would have her second child already by age 15. She would be a grandmother by 30, and she would die probably before she was 35 which was a very healthy attitude. We are made for that. Um, but uh, we have expanded our uh, life expectancy because of science and because of science and because of social pro uh, progress. Yeah, you, and I think you got it, you said it right. It's, we, it's, we can't go back in any we easy way. We cannot go back, even, even to simple things like, like uh, uh, having children, uh, the second children not later, uh, second child not later than 15 or 16. It does not work in our societies, but I've seen it when I worked with uh, uh, Machigengas and Kampa in native Indians in the Amazon. All the young women had their first children when they was, were 14. 15, normally they had two. It does not work in our it, civilizations. It, it doesn't work for cultural reasons and, and other reasons. For, because, for many other reasons. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. hides what we think about about women and, 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 and as partners in a society. It's also the fact that in a modern technological society, you, it's, it's, you need longer time to prepare to be a functioning adult than you did in an in a, in a, in a agrarian nomadic society. I have another question for here. Uh, I would like to go back to the discussion of uh, climate change. Uh, you two are a very good uh, producers of documentary. You are very close to the media. And I think that you understand the importance of words that can make people to understand the message that you have. So what do you think of changing the word climate change and going to the French uh, phrase that is climate misadjustment? that I, can, I think that could be understood more uh, important than just thinking that the temperature will rise two degrees. Because for normal people, a rise of temperature of two degrees is even good. Yeah. But if they do not understand that a rise of two degrees or one degree in the ocean is catastrophic, what do you think? Well, uh, yes, uh, it's a, I hear this for the first time. Uh, sometimes the French have a very good way to express things. Not always, but, uh, uh, but this is a wonderful, a wonderful term. But how do we spread it? Uh, individual films cannot do it, but I think uh, you and, and I in our daily conversations should start to use it. I, I think that's Not that you can enforce it. I think that's the point uh, that, pe that we have to keep emphasizing, is it seems hopeless as an individual faced with global problems. But, but we all influence people around us, and some people have more influence than others, but we all influence our, through our children in our schools or churches or whatever, and, we need, and, and so we all can be evangelists for science and rationality, and in the case of uh, uh, addressing the future with realistic eyes. But your point about, I mean, we've already seen that change. We use the word climate change here, Ten years ago, we used the word global warming, and and so there you can. We're already learning to use words that are better. But here's the problem: I keep wanting to think of the negatives as well as the positives. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the entire, which is this group that studies climate change, their entire budget is less than the budget that the Koch brothers use to to lie about climate change in the media. And as long as there are people spending huge amounts of money to distort reality, it's really hard for people. But we need to try and do it on an individual level. Uy, es que ahora nos hemos quedado ya sin micrófono. 
No está la chica. Es que no está el micrófono. Podéis hablar. We run out of microphones. A ver si. A ver. I got to hold on. Gracias, me oye. Bien, estoy de acuerdo con ustedes que eh, nuestro planeta está excesivamente contaminado, pero no les he escuchado nada de, eh, sobre las soluciones a lo que ya tenemos contaminado. Eh, sí, lo que hay que hacer en el futuro, pero ¿qué es lo que hay que hacer con lo que está ahora? Los océanos llenos de plásticos, como hemos podido ver, con derivados, el aire, la contaminación acústica. Y les dejo aquí uh, una información. Hay un proceso que en, creo que fue en el año 2005, un grupo de ingenieros y físicos eslovacos crearon una máquina que ahora están expandiéndola por el mundo, que con, tomando residuos de, de plásticos y derivados no orgánicos, cada 100 toneladas de esos residuos producen un 20% de petróleo. Petróleo de muy baja calidad, pero que se puede utilizar como combustible para, eh, los, para los navíos, para los barcos. Para el señor Cruz, eh, decirle que yo he estado en muchos países de África no todos los países africanos, no todas las tribus africanas quieren el modelo nuestro occidental de vida, ni nuestro sistema económico, ni nuestro sistema social, ni educativo, y mucho menos también el, 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 el bancario al que usted hacía referencia. Para el señor Herzog, permítame eh, una pregunta. ¿No cree que nos hemos olvidado de algo importante al hablar... Eh, de, de, bueno, lo que quiero decir es que hay que empezar con los niños. Cuando usted habla de evolucionar individualmente para evitar todo lo que, este colapso, no hay, que no hay que empezar con los niños y con una asignatura que en España está absolutamente, yo creo que desaparecida en la mayor parte de, de los centros de enseñanza, que llamábamos entonces, cuando yo era pequeño, humanidades. Formarles que conozcan los griegos, que conozcan los clásicos, filosofía... En fin, las humanidades. Gracias. Well, do yeah. you want to start? Or? Yeah, you start. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, you you raised many good yeah. points. Yeah, because yeah. there was quite a few. Yeah, quite. A, okay, I'll start, the, and then and Werner can. <clears throat> let me let me say um, just quickly to address a few of them. Um, I think that your point to, uh, that it is much it, it is much easier to solve technological problems than social problems. Let me make, I, uh, I think it's much easier. And I, I say that not just as a scientist, but as a, someone, I think, who's witnessed uh, human history and tried to study it. And so I do think that we need, to, we, the, solu the easiest solutions that are going to happen in the near term are technological ones. And I'm not so optimistic about turning plastic into oil because that just perpetuates the problem. I have a friend who's a synthetic biologist, George Church, and He wants to take microbes and have them produce plastic. Take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to produce plastic. Why? Because then he wants to use plastic as building materials. And so, uh, because it, it stores carbon very effectively if you use it as a building material, not in the stomachs of whales. Uh, so, I think that we can imagine technological solutions that are easier To, to produce than, than, than social change. And so it's really important to explore all of those options. So that's the, the first thing I will say. The second thing, though, is educating young people is absolutely essential. It, it's the future, the only hope of uh, young people. I think we need to, but I, I think it's a mistake to just say the humanities, because I think we need technologically literate uh, young people as well as culturally literate young people. And, um, and in fact, uh, it's a, it's a, it, a long-term bee in my bonnet, as we say in the United States, that we tend to call, say that people who can't read are illiterate. But, we don't, but to me, if you can't d do mathematics you're, or, or even appreciate science at some basic level, you're also uncultured and illiterate in a different way. 
We need, to, we need to emphasize a balance where people are not afraid to address the world in a scientific worldview as well as a humanitarian one. And we make the mistake of calling culture just literature and music, which I appreciate greatly. But science is part of our culture. We have to build a unified whole. That's all yeah. I would say. And of course, you addressed uh, <clears throat> many uh, other very serious uh, things like uh, humanities, education of children. What you can do right, right here and now is uh, dissuade your children or grandchildren from using their cell phones too much. Encourage them to read. Read to your grandchildren at night and excite them for literature, for storytelling, for being literate because <clears throat> even when you go to academia in the United States, and I just was in, at Boston University, even in the humanities, even in the classic department, Latin and ancient Greek, uh, the young students barely read anymore. And even those who, who uh, discuss uh, ancient Greek drama cannot articulate three consecutive sentences into one single thought. So that's very, very serious, and, and it has to do with uh, disappearance of, of, of liter literacy as, as it should be there. And uh, once, one thing is you can do something about it with your children, grandchildren. You can do something with your environment, your immediate environment, uh, teaching them that uh, the world disappears for them and becomes secondary only if they take um, the uh, experience of the world from applications on their cell phones. So, and, and what, I do, what I do whenever I'm in public, I encourage everyone who is there, mostly the young people, read, 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 read. That's what gives you an insight into what is going on. That gives you the, the capacity of conceptual thinking. But those who are on Twitter all the time and those who are on Facebook all the time live a secondary, second-hand world and they have, as human beings, lost the cap capacity of conceptualizing and of poetry and of storytelling and of many other things, insight, thinking with a with a head, with a mind of someone else by reading a book. So uh, those are things which are very hard to stop in the long run because the um, disappearance of literacy, meaning that people would read, 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 has disappeared since, I think, since the 60s gradually and has accelerated now. And it's really accelerating. And, and you have to do something about it. And let me add to that. I should also say that I've always been, I've been with Werner when he's talked to film students. He's, for some reason, brought me into that sometimes. And he said, I know, I've heard you say, when people say, what's the one thing a filmmaker should know how to do? And you say, read. Read yes. books, because that's, that's the heart of, and I, and I think it's, it, you've really raised a very important point. And when people cannot read something longer than a tweet, They'll never understand ideas in detail. And, it's a, it, and I do see it in young people, the ability to read long uh, articles, which is what you need to do if you understand anything of substance, whether it's literature or it's politics science. or history. You can't, you can't learn in the sentence. You have to, and it, it is a, it, so reading, I agree completely. Bueno, esta es la última pregunta ya, porque no tenemos que irnos ya. Yeah, I think there's a microphone right there beside you. Yes. Oh. Ah. Pues eh, elegí entre vosotros, eh, porque. Oh, it's a gentleman. Young lady, uh, a kind gentleman. Men are talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Muchas gracias. Uh, one thing, um, one important um, notion that I feel got skipped in this conversation is the dismissal of the indigenous people holding prophecies around this time for seven generations or more. And um, it's said, for instance, that you know the knowledge of the West and the indigenous wisdom are coming together in this time. And um, three days ago, for instance, we saw 
um, that the Mexican president reached out uh, to Spain to um, uh, uh, request an apology for the colonization that happened and the atro atrocities to the indigenous people there. So we are um, not uh, listening to their wisdom and understanding and their voice of nature. Um, to come in this time really together and also honor um, their sense and understanding of Mother Earth, I think is extremely important and missed in the conversation. Thank you. When I hear wisdom of the native <laughs> population, and when I hear the term Mother Earth, I, I become very defensive. <laughs> I do not like these terms. There's something, the Earth never appeared to be motherly to me. But, um, <clears throat> and also the questions of, of indigenous wisdom, it's, it has invaded through a pseudo-philosophy of mm -hmm. new age, pseudo-philosophical babble that I cannot stand. It has invaded our minds. But I do understand, yes, we should look at how did other civilizations, how did other uh, tribal societies live, and how did they cope with the planet? Easy to speak about it when they were nomadic, but yeah. of course there were non-nomadic uh, native populations as well. Um, and, and of course uh, a lot can be learned from them. And, and I do believe that uh, a lot is actually coming at us now, that uh, um, speaking of Mexico, or, or let's say speaking of Peru, for example, that we start to discover that we have not only two different types of potatoes, they had 400. Mm -hmm. And they were very, very intelligent on, on uh, growing different types of potatoes and all of a sudden uh, new markets are opening for that. Or like quinoa yeah. uh, in Bolivia, we have seen it all of a sudden. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge renaissance of quinoa in the local population, the Aymara population understands uh, the, the market value of it, not only the nu nutritional value, all of a sudden the world uh, is knocking at their doors and they respond. They respond with an uh, intensity of, of growing quinoa. And uh, so it's not just a one-sided thing. Uh, we have to knock at their doors as well not only that they have to come and raise their voices. Uh, the, the question of apology for colonization is something I cannot really answer because how far back in time should it go? Um, it, it's probably not so much something on, on a government level. It's, it's something we have, to, we have to decide when we encounter, for example, uh, Quechua speaking or Aymara people mm -hmm. in Bolivia, how do we deal with them? Yeah. How do we take them seriously and listen to them? And, and uh, that's probably more important than issuing a hollow, probably a very hollow political declaration that ultimately doesn't, doesn't mean much. It probably means much more the way we would speak, for example, to our uh, Aymara uh, driver yeah. uh, in Bolivia. And, and he felt totally, totally wonderful with, uh, with you who would explain certain cosmological things to them as a scientist. Well, okay, that's an interesting segue because I actually thought that between the two of us you would say something much more politically incorrect than me. But, but now let me try because um, I, I, ha I have a more, even a greater aversion maybe than, than Werner to this notion of ancient wisdom in the sense that, of course, I'm a student, I love history, okay? So I love learning about cultures, and I do love the fact that the more, in many ways, to see that the, 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 the life of, of someone 2,000 years ago had very many similarities to mine in way, even though it was a different world. But I think that this, um, we, we, most of the, uh, sir, First of all, I, I'm also a poor this notion of apology. I didn't colonize anybody. 
the, I, I, my, my wife is, uh, I met in Australia, and every time I would go to a, an event, they'd, it would have to begin with an apology to the Aboriginal tribes whose land they now occupied. Well, if they really cared, they wouldn't occupy it anymore. It's just a hollow bunch of words. I think we have to get over that and realize that, yes, this, the world we live in was based on atrocity and colonization and imperialism, and that's a fact. But I don't think we, we, we go anywhere by apologizing. We go now forward to think about building a better world. And, and similarly, the wisdom of ancients was often not wisdom at all. It was based on these prophecies and silliness was based on myths and that we've now learned to overcome. So, for example, just to say something that I'm... You are going to benefit in, this, in the Canary Islands by the fact that a big telescope is going to be built on La Palma that was going to be built on Hawaii, which is a better place for that particular telescope. Why? Because some people thought that mountain is sacred and we can't build a telescope on it. Well, to me, that's just nonsense and I can't abide by it at all and I think we need to grow up. That's all. Yeah. I guess the people agree with you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I said something.